A group of NDC supporters uh, in Tamale calling itself the loyal NDC supporters have described as unwarranted comments by a section of uh, the members who say the change in leadership in parliament did not come at a better time. They say there's no better time than now. According to the group, uh, there's no better time than now for the party uh, in terms of 2024 elections than now. Addressing the media in Tamale, spokesperson Mohamed Mutala said there is enough time for the party to mobilize its supporters to recapture power. He charged the new leadership in parliament to work hard to help the party win the 2024 elections. Mr. Mutala also urged the leadership to rally behind the party to win the 16 seats in the northern region. We wish to express our appreciation and support to the national executives for the timely decision to have made changes in the front of NDC leadership in parliament. It is a very welcoming decision that would inject fresh energy and dynamism in the NDC parliamentary front. Ladies and gentlemen, timing of the decision, we want to emphatically state that there's no better time to have made these kind of changes in parliament then now. now thank you. We mean now. The time is ripe. We have enough time to build consensus for victory 2024. Our expectation of the national executives and new leadership in parliament to the teaming grassroots of the NDC in Northern Region are one to recapture power from the MPP in the 2024 election. Two, to increase parliamentary seats in Northern Region to at least 16 as well as presidential votes to 95% of total valid vote cast. Three, help promote dialogue and unity among NDC stakeholders in Northern Region. Four, be firm with NDC party loyalty. Five, Passionately neutral in all internal party activities in Northern Region. Yes. I repeat, passionately neutral in all internal party activities in Northern Region and other regions across the country. Yes. Yes. Six, be honest beyond any form of trade, business, profiteering in the House of Parliament. Yes. Thank you. Yes. Religious and humble enough to build consensus within minority caucus. Remember, and I repeat, remember, if you press yourself, our super incompetent mm -hmm. opponents currently will wow. buy you and buy you far below your price as minority leaders. In conclusion, the teaming grassroots of the great NDC are hungry for power and not position and titles. Yes. 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 Above all, oh, no, no, no. we want to state hey, ah. without any provocation that as citizens of no, our no, motherland, no. Ghana, we are free to express our opinions and move around freely without any hindrance whatsoever. No one, and I repeat, no one has their singular right to threaten the movement of anybody the national executives are therefore free to visit any part of their country at will without any fear, including Northern Region. My colleague Martina Bugri has been following this for journey. She joins us with more. Martina, how is the group justifying its position that the change in NDC leadership in Parliament is actually coming at a better time as far as the 2024 elections is concerned? For them, they think that the old leadership have played their role. It is about time a new leadership come, rally the people, because they are going into an election they call crucial. And so they need people who will unite the entire country to be able to win the election. And that is why they think that the timing is now for a new team to, take, to come on board to lead the party in parliament and to work hand in hand with the national and regional executives to help uh, capture the power in 2024. What, what mistakes do, did they say that the former leadership made and that warrants, uh, that is why they think there should be new leadership as far as the 2024 elections is concerned? They didn't mention any mistakes. What they are saying is that 
uh, as human beings at any point in time when you think that you need a change in your system. If people should be free to offer that change. And that is what the party has seen. The party has seen um, the, the, the issues the party has raised as reasons why they are changing. They back it and think that the time is now for them. But Dr. Atto Forsen, whose appointment as minority leader has been met with several agitations, including that of the Sawase constituency, is calling for calm amongst the minority caucus. He says he has met with the former minority leader and has had what he called fruitful and positive conversations. He says he is ready to lead with high integrity. Dr. Forsen has been addressing a news conference in Parliament Thursday. First... Let me say that I'm deeply honored and humbled to have been chosen to lead our gallant NDC minority caucus in Ghana's parliament. I wish to use this opportunity again to thank the leadership of our great NDC party who have placed their trust and confidence in me. I am also deeply grateful to our colleagues, the rank and file of our great party, the NDC, and the people of Ghana for their profound support and solidarity. I have held fruitful and positive conversation, in fact, frank conversation with my senior brother, the Honorable Haruna Idrisu. I commended him for his admirable leadership and stewardship when he was granted the opportunity by a great party to lead us. As leader, I will be, it will be my duty to represent our collective, our collective goals in particular, with an unwavering dedication, and most importantly, with high integrity. I have no doubt that with the support of the entire minority caucus in Parliament, we shall succeed. Dr. Cassia Letofosen is getting to work already as minority leader, outlining his three main actions for the next one month. He has also been defending his experience and leadership credentials. First responsibility is to unite the caucus, and that will be number one on the agenda. Things of this nature happens, but obviously there's the need for us to show leadership and we will do just that. Most importantly, I will focus the next month, I will focus the next month to tackle three things. First, I wish to first of all send a message to the MPP that the people of Ghana are calling on them to downsize their government, to reflect the mood of the country. You are asking people to forgo their coupons or interest. You are asking the ordinary Ghanaian to sacrifice his payout. And so therefore, if His Excellency the President intends to reshuffle his government, let it be known that we in the NDC will not accept an attempt to increase the size of government. And if the current size of his ministers increase by one, that one person may not receive our cooperation. And in the end, we also wish to assure the people of Ghana that as part of our engagement with the Finance Committee and the Health Committee, we have agreed to do public hearing on the audit of the COVID-19 expenditure, public hearing, beginning on the 7th of February, 2023. At that point, we will pay due diligence to the duties given to us as the people of Ghana. And then finally, finally, we will also embark on a roadshow where we will galvanize the people of Ghana and educate them on the meaning 
of what this economic crisis is going to take us through. But to conclude on this matter, I will appeal to the rank and file of our great NDC party to keep calm. Members of parliament are in good hands. We will work with them with due diligence. Obviously, obviously, we are not new in this house. I've been in this house for 14 years. I know the capabilities of all our colleagues. Some I met, some came to meet me. I have worked closely with most of our colleagues, and I can assure you that together we shall succeed. The Wa High Court has added to the woes of two notorious armed robbers sentenced to 20 years imprisonment with another sentence that will keep them in jail for another 35 years. Supervising Wa High Court Judge Justice Yusuf Asibe sentenced the duo to a combined 35 years imprisonment and in hard labor for robbery. To join news as Upper West Region correspondent Rafiq Salam reports that two robbers already are serving a 20 year prison sentence at the Wa Central Prison for robbery. The trial, presided over by the supervising Wa High Court judge, Justice Aladu Yusuf Asibi, lasted for 14 months. The crime was alleged to have been committed by four notorious hardened criminal quadruplet cabal who makes life uncomfortable for travelers on the solar Wa Highway. One of the suspects was lynched by the village folks, whilst another is at large. Two of the suspects 19-year-old Musa Al-Hassan and 20-year-old Isaac Muizdin were therefore arrested and slapped with four charges, attempted robbery, robbery, unlawful entry, and harm. They pleaded no guilty to the charges and had no legal representation. In the end, the first accused, Musa Al-Hassan, was found guilty of the four charges and sentenced to 20-year imprisonment, while the second accused, Isaac Muizdin, was found guilty of three charges and sentenced to 15 years imprisonment and in hard labor. Here is the prosecutor and principal state attorney at the Ministry of Justice and Attorney General's Department in the Upper West Region, lawyer Shahid Abdul Shakur, stating the facts of the case. On the 13th of November 2021, four armed men around Ga between Ga and Samombo stopped travelers and robbed them of various sums of money. In the process, a pregnant woman who was eight months pregnant was being taken to the hospital because he had problems. And then they stopped him, but the motor rider managed to escape with the pregnant woman and rushed her to the nearest village and informed the village. And the village mobilized and came in and was able to arrest one of the accused persons. That's the first accused person. But the three other persons managed to escape. Later in the night, that was around 2 a.m., later in the night, the police again had information and moved in and arrested the second accused person. But the fourth accused person was also arrested by the village, um, villagers. Unfortunately, by the time the police got there, he was lynched. The third accused person is on the run. We, are, we, are, we don't know his whereabouts, and I think that we are still fighting to get him. But today we had a judgment after about a year of trial the court ruled today and found as a fact that we have proven our case beyond reasonable doubt and they were convicted and sentenced to 15 years imprisonment IHL. The two jailbirds are already serving 20 years sentence for robbery by the Wasekur court. Same accused persons were already convicted by the circuit court because at the time that they were on trial, at some point they were admitted to bail and during the time of their bail, they went and committed another robbery again. This time round, they was arraigned before circuit court, and the circuit court expeditiously dealt with them and sentenced them to 20 years imprisonment in the, in the circuit court case. And now, today, they've been sentenced to 15 years imprisonment. It means they will have a double warrant 
after serving their 20 years, they will be back to serve their 15 years imprisonment. So a total of 35 years in, in, in custody. One major stumbling block on fighting crime in the Upper West region is the subculture of the people, normally referred to here as Tijabun Yeni, to wit, we are all one. Lawyer Shahid Abdul Sakur called on the people to desist from it and expose criminals and their elements in the society. Education watchers have described as worrying the increasing trend of examination more practices. The 2022 BEC recorded 75 exams more practices, an increase to the previous 46. Also, 1,309 students missed out on last year's basic education certificate examination out of the 552,288 students that entered for the exams. There was also cancellation of the subject results of 416 candidates and three private candidates for the offense of either bringing foreign materials into the examination or colluding with other candidates. Extracts of a statement released by Wayek uh, reads, and it says a total of 552,288 candidates made up of 276,999 males and 275,000 289 females entered for the school exams. This includes 65 candidates with visual impairment, 427 with hearing impairment, and 54 candidates with other test accommodation needs. Out of the total number of candidates who entered, 4,309 4, candidates were absent. The BEC for private candidates recorded a total entry figure of 1,144 candidates. This was made up of 641 males and 503 females. And out of that total uh, who entered for the examination, 84 candidates were absent. That's for the private sector. Now, you, they talked about examination more practices and it says following the completion of investigations carried out into some of the cases of examination more practices detected during the conduct of the examinations and it spoke about a number of the examination more practices cancellation of subject results of 416 school candidates withholding of subject results of 38 school candidates pending conclusion of investigations cancellation of entire results of 73 school candidates and two private candidates for the offense of bringing mobile phones into the exams hall, withholding of entire results of 11 school candidates pending conclusion of investigations. Meanwhile, the scripts of candidates from 40 schools in certain subjects are undergoing scrutiny. That withheld results of candidates may be cancelled or released based on the outcome of the investigation. And there's a caution coming from the council. It says all stakeholders must be wary of first tests who promise to upgrade results for a fee. Candidates are to note that WIAC results are secured and can be authenticated. And it concludes that uh, it's expressed gratitude to all stakeholders, especially Ministry of Education, GS, and the rest. And it's signed by Victor Brew, his head of legal affairs at the National Head Office. Executive Director of Africa Education Watch, Kofi Asari, says this is worrying. You know, we are in an era where, uh, you know, the demand for examination from the small practices is increasing. And um, yes, why it is putting in place measures to ensure that people who participate in it are sanctioned. Um, that, that is really reactionary. It's, it's fine, but we need to do a lot of work, you know, and then prevent this kind of thing. If you look at the number of students who had their entire result cancelled before because they took mobile phones to the examination hall, between 2020 and 2022, it has increased from 44 to 46 and then all the way to uh, 74. So, you know, so the jump, the jump we are experiencing in the number of students who had their result cancelled as a result of mobile phones from 46 to 2021. 75. No. So, so, so the, the number is 73. No, it's, it's, it's 75. Okay. The number is for students who were in, in, in uh, for, for, the, for school candidates and then two for primary candidates. Mm, okay. So average is 75. Yeah. Okay. Okay. That, 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 that trend is, is a disturbing trend. And it means that 
more and more work needs to be done at the central level, um, um, you know, and at the school level to, to reorient students about examination. That you don't need to plan to cheat to succeed in an examination. You know, and, and at the basic school, you, I mean, you agree with me that the student have access to mobile phones and they're smuggling them to the application hall. It means that to understand the parents or guardians have, have an idea because most students are not working and they don't have them to have phones. So a lot more awareness needs to be done, you know, at the community level to change the minds and perceptions of, of parents and students in respect of uh, examination or practice and the need to approach an application of integrity. Mm. That is where I think we all have responsibility uh, and tolerance. Okay. But, but we Let's stick to education issues because while 7,000 school children in the Kwandai district featured in our schools of shame series continue to slam it hard on the birth floor because of the lack of furniture, Ghana's Education Minister Dr. Yawase Duchum has questioned why the plight and struggles of the rural poor people is being published. This follows the airing of two out of the four part schools of shame series put together by Joy News. The Education Minister, Dr. Ayawe Duchum, has been responding to the Joy News findings. Ministry of Education, we believe that the better days of our nation, Ghana, is ahead of us and not behind us. Recently, I saw some TV programming. They were talking about Ghana's school of shame. And I was ashamed. Because of all the great things happening in the country, we want to focus on the negative and get the world to know that there are negative things in Ghana. Can you look straight in the eye of these children and tell me they are coming from schools of shame? They are coming from schools of fame. They're going to change the story of Ghana. This young man and woman has a fierce determination and is palpable when you get close to them. They want to change the face of this country. What we couldn't do, they are going to do it. All that we need to do is to let them know that yes, there are challenges in the country, but we should shine a spotlight on these great things that we are doing. And if we can take a cue, we should rather do a program that highlights these young men and women and tell the world that Ghana is moving. It's part of the challenges. Member of Parliament for North Tong and a former Deputy Minister of Education, Samuel Okujeto Ablakwa, says the minister uh, must rather provide solutions to the highlighted problems. He spoke with my colleague uh, Samuel Kujabriz. Joy must be commended for this series, which you call Ghana Schools of Shame. And really, it is a most appropriate title. These schools represent our collective shame. All of us in leadership must be embarrassed. And you see, ministers don't tell journalists what they should cover, what they should focus on. When you are doing your positive program where he was speaking, you went to cover. You didn't say you would not go cover that. But when you decide, by way of editorial discretion, mm -hmm. that you are going to also highlight the ills, the challenges, the shortcomings, it should not be condemned. Mm -hmm. And it should not be dismissed. So that arrogance of power would not help us. And it means that the minister is therefore not going to take action. What I expected to hear from the minister is that this is what we have outlined. This is our program. We have taken note we have put together a database of the number of schools we have in this country without furniture. These are the plans. By two years, three years, we are going to clear the backlog and we are going to address this. Now you are condemning the media for highlighting. But by now, now, this, this challenge that we are highlighting yeah. today has been there for, yes. for a long time. Yes. Even when you were deputy minister, of education. Yes. Why are we still dealing? Why why was it not fixed during your time? Why are we still have to dealing with this? Yes. So today. You see, so that's why we came up with the school under trees policy. Mm. 
Away from education, investment banker Kwekwa Doboli says government's gold for oil deal may not be sustainable. Ghana has so far received 41,999 metric tons of petroleum products under the program, which caters for 20% of the country's monthly needs. Though government assures it has enough gold to sustain the deal, Kwekwa Doboli says he sees some red flags which government must not ignore. He spoke with my colleague, Blazet Soga. I have a program called Gold for Oil. And the point of gold is that gold for oil is that rather than uh, exchanging the gold for dollars, mm -hmm. which are scarce, and then using those dollars to go and buy the oil, yeah. we go to the person who's selling the oil and say, hey, we've got gold. It's perfectly fungible with, gold, with, with dollars. So take the gold and you go and do the exchange, right? Um, now, that will work based on or as far as the person who is receiving CDs can digest those CDs, right? Let me, let me, let me frame that okay, for you. Yeah. So let's say uh, Total Energies, who are a big seller of petrol in this country. Total Energies earn CDs. What they want to do is they want to sell those CDs and collect dollars so they can take the dollars home to France yeah. or euros and take the euros home to France. That's what they want to do, right? Um, now what the government is saying is, okay, we're going to give you gold instead. Um, but to get gold, they have to give someone, they have to get the gold from someone. So yeah. the person, the gold manufacturer gets given CDs, right? Because the, the government's not going to give them dollars, they're going to give them CDs. CDs. So yeah. it depends on how much CDs the gold manufacturer can digest. If there's productive capacity in Ghana for them to spend those CDs on, then they'll take the CDs up to the point where they can no longer spend those CDs. It depends on how much they can digest. So let's say Total Energy spends $50 million worth of CDs inside Ghana every year. They'll take CDs up to that $50 million. Beyond Once that, we exceed that... Then they can't digest it. They don't have anything So it's to not do. sustainable. So start pushing back. It becomes sustainable if you increase your productive capacity inside the country. The more service you can make Total pay for in the country, the more CDs they can digest. We're still live on Joy News today here in the studios of Joy News in Kokom Limle. We'll be back with business. <music>
Hello, welcome to the business segment on Joy News Today with me, Pius Kojobaka. The Ghana Revenue Authority's tax assessment of multinational companies operating in the country is becoming or is coming under serious scrutiny. This was after oil production and exploration company Talu challenged over $300 million tax charge on the operations for this year. George Biafe has the rest of the story. Talu Oil in its January trading statement and operational update to its investors described the assessment done by the Ghana Revenue Authority for its 2023 operations as lacking merit and is therefore pushing for an engagement with government and the Revenue Authority to review this tax charge. The oil exploration and production giant is also raising serious questions about a similar one that was done for last year even after that assessment had been reviewed. But for some, this development can be described as interesting, coming after a similar 8 billion Ghana cities tax charge on MTN, which the telecoms giant is also contesting. Joy Business is aware of another multinational that is disputing the tax authority's verdict on its tax obligations for its operations for last year. But the Ghana Revenue Authority is insisting that it stands by its work done on all these firms operating in the country. But is this the question of these multinationals don't want to honor their full tax obligations to the state based on their operations in the country? Or the Ghana Revenue Authority is trying to find some innovative means to meet their tax revenue target for this year? Or maybe government just need more money to manage the economy in these challenging times? Jafi with our report. Now, Minister for Energy Dr. Matthew Poku Prempe has lashed out at developed countries for cohesively asking African countries to embark on energy transition, describing it as unfair. According to him, there is the need for developing countries to explore its natural resources and benefit from it to support economic growth. Speaking at the first University of Ghana 75th anniversary public lecture, he however said the developed world have failed fulfill, to fulfill their promises in line with the energy transition plan. Ghana's position, we also don't lose sight. And our position makes it imperative for us to be also the chief advocates of energy transition in Africa and beyond. We believe Ghana and that Africa should transition to cleaner forms of energy. However, we believe that we should use our God-endowed gifts to undertake this transition. Why? Simply because since the climate, Paris Climate Conference in 2015, every promise that was made to the developing world to be able to participate in this transition has been delivered in its negative. What was promised technology has never been delivered, and what was promised of finance to make us transition has never been developed. But we don't still think that we should not participate. In fact, we should be good advocates of energy transition in Ghana and in Africa. But since we don't have the money and the technology, we should rely on what God has given us and given us in abundance to enable us transit. In the last 10 years, Almost all important oil finds have been found in Africa, or gas finds have been found in Africa. Africa's oil and gas industry, it's not even more than 50 years maximum. So to be told all of a sudden, one hot afternoon, that you have to leave those assets in the ground because we are transitioning, we in Africa feel that it is a bit unfair. We contribute less than 4% of the global greenhouse gas emissions. In fact, if we add all the confirmed gas finds in Africa, confirmed resource of gas in Africa, and we decide to burn all of it, we will still not even achieve a 4% global greenhouse gas emissions. And that's it by way of business here on Join News today, uh, today with me, Pius Kojobaka. There will be more business news when I come your way on the marketplace at 1 p.m. Please stay. Let's do sports now on Joy News today with me, Muftar Nabila Abdullah, General Secretary of the Ghana Football Association, Prosper Harrison Addo, has revealed that women's Premier League clubs will be paid the second tranche of the sponsorship money due them before the commencement of the competition. 
this weekend. Uh, speaking at a press conference on Wednesday, Prosper revealed that it was um, a, a promise made by the president of the Ghana Football Association before the start of the season. We are going to re uh, resume with March the 8th, coming weekend. We can only wish all the teams the very best and um, for the teams. So this is directly to the teams. Your money is already. So we we'll ensure that you receive them. I'm sure you receive the first one uh, with the president promising you that by the time we resume, the second tranche will be ready. Uh, true to the word of the president, it is ready and you will get them um, in your bank account before you go and play, unless you have problems with your bank. <laughs> so we would uh, do that. Um, we, we've also ensured that officiating and um, all the requirements there uh, will be met. Um, we've taken stock of another set of referee equipment and so trust that uh, there will be equipment coming to the women's game. Um, so the lady referees will be using as we resume um, from my day eight. And so we expect um, improvements in officiating and um, better games uh, going forward. We need all the big teams in the country, the men's big team, teams to create women's teams. And I'm glad to hear from our crowds of folk that they are almost ready to start their women's team. We can only be proud of this and to urge all the others to also start because it's going to be a major requirement going forward when you play in Africa. Um, currently, the, the licensing policy, every Premier League club is supposed to help a ladies team. Uh, as we resume this weekend, I will personally go around and inquire from them the kind of help they are giving to the teams they have adopted. And uh, we go to Algeria now and hear from the media officer of the Black Galaxies, William Bosman, he says the commitment of the players is to ensure that they reach the final of the competition. Media reports had suggested that the players have decided to revolt and also boycott training sessions because bonuses due them have not been paid. But Bosman says the bigger motivation for the players is to reach the final. Yes, just immediately after the defeat to Madagascar in the opening game, Coach Anna Walker rallied the boys around. He, 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 he boosted their morale. He told them, well, it's not over. It's just a game. They should just let that game go. And then they still have a game against Sudan to go. And the win against Sudan will, will all but ensure that we go through to the next round of the competition. And also, um, Dr. Prosper, who is assistant coach, also had a time with the boys, a one-on-one -on -one session with some of the boys. And then it's really helped in boosting their morale in the game, to get, the game against Sudan. And, and we, 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 we got a win in that game. I mean, against Niger, tell me, what is the plan? What is the plan? Because there were reports that the bonuses of the team had not been paid, but the Ministry of Youth and Sports dismissed that entirely, that the team had received, had received their, their, their winning bonuses, etc. But tell me, what is the plan ahead of that game against Niger? The Black Dallas is very hopeful of going into the game uh, against Sudan and get a win because the team came here with one one mission the team came here with the mission to go all out and ensure that ghana gets to the final you know ghana has been to two finals in this competition and it's a it's a it's a, an aim for this particular team that's your sports for now but we do have more sports stories on my joy online.com just as you can see right behind me black stars need a coach who won't take orders from people as Samoajan and Kwesi Apia says stripping as Samoajan of the Black Stars captaincy was the right decision he took. And you'll be hearing more of that on Prime Tech tomorrow when uh, we bring you that interview on the AM show. We appreciate your company.
Up next is World News. Welcome to Showbiz here on Joy News. Today, our US based Ghanaian musician and manager of dance group DWP US Wing, K. Williams, has shared the importance of dance to the creative arts industry. According to him, dancers are the foot soldiers of Afrobeat, and their impacts cannot and should not be swept under the carpet. What I say is that um, dance, or well, let me say, dancers are the foot soldiers of Afrobeat. They're actually the ones who, who have spread who have spread Afrobeat all mm. across uh, the world. So all these challenges we see, it's all dancers. They're the ones who spread, they spread the culture faster than anybody. Like, look at TikTok, it's all dance moves, yeah. right? So it's, it's something that has been very impactful. Here in America, with us, DWP USA, we're working with labels now. We're working with, like, teams, touring agencies when they need dancers with that one-stop shop. You don't need to go looking for multiple dancers at a time. We're just here. Mm. We have the academy. We train with the art artists. We, we've worked with people like Guilty Beats, mm. King Promise, um, Voodoo Main. We've worked with Chrissy Arthur recently. We were at his show. So any African artist that comes here that needs a family to, you know, escort. Because now artists are beginning to invest in their crafts more. So they're getting dances on stage with them. And these dances are also influencers. So it's a marketing tool for them too. So it goes hand in hand. Very impactful. Away from Kay Williams, musician Camido has bemoaned lack of support for creatives by government. According to him, the sector can be better with the right support system and is pleading that they pay attention. He spoke on Daybreak Hits this morning. I went to a BGMS seminar and then somebody raised the point that, oh, the people, some people want to come and invest and change and help us, like, you know, build rebuild our publishing system or whatever then the government policies then this one so all those things bro we really need to like stand and build our industry government does not really like i don't think that government really like looks the side of entertainment because we have to ask them we have to teach them to see the essence of you know look in this direction mm. if you are watching crada you know like hearing that they are building a cathedral bro like <laughs> i don't even know exactly what like that um scheme is about but for me like that is not my point but i feel like just as much as they can concentrate or like focus or prioritize certain yeah, areas, areas same way the music industry should be prioritized every artist our a-list artists are all doing shows at the dome how many capacity be that place bro like stadium shows like i was tweeting yesterday i was like bro stadium shows for just day like this for us like for our ogs they go do them they go just say okay supporting or uh, this person with me to add a gum you know like then we to we they learn from that then we they see say hey this is how it should well on that note we end showbiz here on joy news today my name is becky for more showbiz news log on to myjoinline.com that's where you find all the news and we have more showbiz news in our subsequent bulletins good afternoon to you aisha hello beautiful becky that's how we wrap up the bulletin this afternoon log on to myjoinline.com there's more of the news my name is aisha Prime. Do enjoy the rest of our programs.